Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me to jam about some NBA and NHL playoff action is Jared Hawkman, publishing editor for Covers.com. You can follow him on Twitter at JLHawk. Jared, great to have you back on the show. Yeah, Rob, it's great to be back here again. You know, we talked a little bit before some of these opening rounds get started. Now we're going to kind of review it and see what's happening. Been some, some expected games, a little bit of upsets, you know, but it's a lot more fun and exciting stuff ready to happen. I mean, I do want to say, you know, condolences to your Penguins. They went the same way as my Knicks, which is we're not playing anymore. Uh, there's always next year, but you know, there's a lot of great teams and great players and things that we're going to be able to watch going ahead. So we are recording this on Thursday at noon Eastern, and we're going to do the best that we can to provide so much value for you on these series, but also more importantly, on all of what's going on moving forward from a future standpoint. That way we can have this thing live a little bit longer than just, oh, when did I listen to this podcast? And I feel like you and I are talking at a perfect time. And certainly we're going to get to the Knicks and the Penguins and everything that's gone on with the playoffs. But let's start with this. And I know uh, last night when you and I were watching collectively the Knicks Hawks game uh, on Twitter, we both had a similar feeling. And what I tweeted out was, that the Knicks were slow to the ball to get rebounds. And to me, it very much felt like when I watched the Maple Leafs in game seven and I watched the Canadians get to every single puck first and even ones when they're dumping it in the zone and you're like, how is Toronto not getting to this? The same malaise I felt on the Knicks and you chimed in saying that, it's just, it's crazy how these teams in these do or die games cannot show up and give their biggest effort. And it's probably one of the biggest challenges and mysteries as a sports fan that some of the best teams in the world, both good playoff teams and bad playoff teams can just not completely show up in the playoffs in do or die games. And we've seen it multiple times across both sports. Yeah, no, you're right. And, you know, if you look at, you know, I'll start with the Knicks, you know, it's kind of funny that they made their living all season outworking other teams. I mean, the Knicks always had a talent disadvantage this year. I mean, they were projected, you know, to what finished like 21 wins, finished like 12 or 13th in the East, and they finished fourth. And they did that by, you know, night in and night out through all 72 regular season games, outworking every team and giving their best effort. Now, when you come to the playoffs, I get it. You know, every team is bringing their max effort again. So talent shines a little bit through. But to just see the Knicks, you know, I don't want to say they quit, but you could see in that game five, you know, the garden was rocking. They needed to come out strong and it didn't. They came out flat, you know, more poor shooting. Uh, you know, Randall struggled again. Derek kind of struggled. You know, the whole team struggled. With him. And Derek Rose had nothing left in his legs. And as the game wore on and you got to that second half and, you know, Atlanta pulled away a little bit, you could just see like the life come out. And then the end, the effort stopped. You know, you stopped. You said those rebounds were just bouncing towards, you know, out through their hands to Atlanta. Atlanta's working a little bit harder. You know, it's really demoralizing. It just compounds that you see these teams that are so based on effort just and not even give the effort anymore. And then you switch to a team like the Leafs where, you know, they lost the series. If they were still the more talented team, if you look at that roster top to bottom, they had more talent than Montreal. But Montreal outworked them. And that's a great equalizer, especially in hockey. Hockey, you know, it's half skill. It is half also that will and that desire to get that puck battle, to get to that dirty area, and, to, you know, just to get to the spot first and outwork your team. But you look at a Leafs team in game seven. They're at home, you know, and they have all these this decade plus of, you know, playoff disappointment, not getting out of the first round. This is the year, all the weight on their shoulders. And you expect the team in that situation, you know, to come out in that first 10 minutes and they will, they're going to be flying. They're going to be hitting. They're really going to put the pressure and put Montreal on their back heel. And they didn't. Montreal, it was a very boring flat start to that game. Montreal got to settle in very quickly. And then that talent gap was closed again because then Montreal was able to work harder and just had more effort and energy. And, it, you know, I mean, that's why sports psychologists and sports psychology is a big thing because I will never understand how, with all this pressure, you know, all these things and all the embarrassment you want to avoid, you can't come out and just try your best and try your hardest. And you don't have to win. 
you don't have to, you know, score a hat trick, but to not have that effort and, you know, to go that extra mile to win, it just, it really does baffle me. And we will start by talking about the NBA playoffs because I think the perfect transition would be into Lakers Suns because I've mentioned this numerous times on the show. My spider sense said something wasn't right about the Lakers. And yeah, there's the Anthony Davis injury, but some of this malaise that we're talking about has showed up at various times in the playoffs against the Suns team where you're like, do the Lakers really care? Like they, they won the championship. They feel like they can turn it on at any point, but then all of a sudden they lose AD and he's got this groin injury. And, and that's not exactly one that's going to pop back very quickly. And as we sit here, I want to look at some of the futures uh, options in this game. And remember I laid, I had row hit on the podcast and he recommended Suns to win the title because if they can get past the Lakers, I jumped on board Suns plus 3000 right now, both the Lakers and the Suns are plus 1100 to win the title. Look at that. Both of them have the same odds to put that into perspective. Suns are plus 3000 Lakers are plus 450 right now. The Lakers on Thursday are plus 220 to win the series. So Jared, I'll ask you, do you believe in the Lakers to win this series first? Cause if so, you can get plus 220. Well, I, I think I'm going to come back to that effort thing. And if there's one player in or two players on each team that Lily will never not give effort. And it starts with the Suns and Chris Paul. He will leave it all on the floor forever. You never have to question his effort level. And then you talk about the Lakers malaise and some of that comes back to LeBron. Now, listen, LeBron is a competitor. He wants to win. But, you know, at his age now, like LeBron doesn't put a full 48 minutes together anymore. You know, he kind of takes some time off. You know, he'll coast in like the second quarter a little bit or he'll take the foot off the gas a little bit there. And the Lakers can't really afford to do that without Anthony Davis. I mean, you know, you've got Schroeder and you've got Drummond and some of these other guys, you know, Taylor Horton, Tucker and Caruso. But like these guys can't carry you if your star players aren't giving 110% the whole time. Um, I, like you said, I don't think Anthony Davis – is going to play. I know he's a game time decision, but even if he plays, like it's a groin injury, he's going to be limited. Like he's not going to be able to move and play like he does. And DeAndre Ayton has been a beast for Phoenix, you know, in this series, even when AD was healthy and without him, you know, they romped last game, you know, and Chris Paul, I know he re-aggravated the shoulder injury, um, but he's still going to at least give that leadership and that fire and keep that team motivated. Even if they're down 15 or something in like the third quarter, they're not going to quit. Um, I can see the Lakers if they fall behind big again. You know, he, he, LeBron is not great at hiding his body language and hiding his dismay. And I think if they fall behind, you might see that and that might trickle out to the team. Um, it's incredible to say, you know, how can you not want to take the Lakers at plus 250 to win this series? Um, but I just think the Suns are a little bit healthier. I mean, Paul's injury doesn't seem to be as bad as Davis's. And then I just think Davis needs so much of that team compared to what Phoenix still has. They're just a little bit deeper. I, I kind of got to like them. I mean, Phoenix is also great on the road this year. They're 26 and 12 ATS in the road and the Lakers struggled to cover at home. Um, so I just think you're going to see another low scoring defensive game. And I just think Chris Paul's will and desire and desperation, because, you know, he, he needs to win. He, has, he hasn't really done it ever. Is going to just kind of shine through with this, Phoenix team just a little bit more than LeBron. Like you said, they, they won the title. They played a lot of basketball in the last year and a half from the bubble title and this, you know, it just, they're just not as talented and the gas might tank might be empty. So now let's look on the larger picture from a win the title perspective, because both of these teams sitting there plus 1100, I can't say anyone's exactly in love with the rest of what we're seeing in the West right now. Uh, looking the jazz are the favorites to come out of the West at plus 140. And I sit back and I remember saying, I do not believe the Jazz are going to come out the West. It was just like before the playoffs started, that wasn't going to happen. But then all of a sudden, the Clippers, in the most Clippers fashion, they can't win a game at home. They're plus 550 to win the West. We'll get to that series right there. So it seems like this Lakers Sun series has a great opportunity for value if you want one of these two teams to come out of the West 
or to potentially win the title themselves. Let's start with the Lakers side of things. I think certainly, as Charles Barkley said, Anthony Street closed Davis. That's the biggest challenge you have for them coming out of the West or winning the title is do we have any faith that he's going to stay healthy? Because if they play this, is he there? Is he not there? Game the rest of the playoffs. They're not going to win the title. So that's what you're really betting on. So let's start with that. If the Lakers were to find a way to get past the Suns here, what do you think about them moving forward? Well, I mean, you can't discredit them because like I said, they did win the title and when they're healthy, that's probably the best one, two combo in the league. It's still LeBron and Anthony Davis is great, but that big factor is if they're healthy, you know, Anthony Davis has never been the, you know, beacon of health and reliability throughout his entire NBA career. So it's no surprise. It's no surprise to see that he's, you know, flirting with the injury report game in game out, especially because you're looking at a groin, that's not going to go away. You know, that's not, you know, he didn't tweak his ankle and he could heal. You know, this is a growing thing. This will keep getting worse and getting re-aggravated as you keep playing. You know, as you're jumping, as you're moving, as you're cutting. Um, so there's always that thing of, you know, if they get over the hump, they get past, you know, that tough first round challenge, you know, that might, you know, push them forward to start them. But, you know, I'm looking at the other teams that are still around. The Lakers are struggling to guard good, per- or good post teams, as you saw with Aiden here. I mean, the Jazz, they got Rudy Gobert. I mean, he's a, he's a great rim protector, and he can make some stuff happen in the paint. Um, you know, you look at, I mean, the Clippers, I mean, if, if they're going to get through, they don't really have a dominant uh, uh, presence down low. But, you know, you look at Dallas, they've kind of, you know, they got Chris Stapps and Boban and those guys. They got some bodies at least. Um, but I think, you know, the biggest challenge for them is the Jazz, and because of Gobert, it makes it tough. But if they get through and Davis fights through this, yeah, it is hard to say no. But I still can't get over the fact that they're the same price as the Suns. Who were the two seed? I mean, Phoenix finished second in the West. Like that's, there's a reason they finished second, right? And, you know, they don't just have a big guy. They don't just have Chris Paul. Like they got Devin Booker, who might be the most electric scorer in the Western Conference. Um, so, no, they've got those pieces. They play defense. They get some athletic wings. And like I said, that value is great. Uh, the Jazz, you know, they look good. I mean, Memphis gave them a run, though. I mean, John Moran, they, they played him tough. Um, they just, you know, the consistency for the Jazz was good. Donovan Mitchell is another guy that can get to a bucket at any time. Um, so it, it's, there's no teams that really inspire a ton of confidence. Like every team in the West seems like they have some good pluses, but there's a couple of flaws that really make you wonder at any time game. So when I look at the Jazz, like plus 140 seems a little bit too respectful for a team. And like, I can see them losing in the next round very easily. Are the Suns more attractive? So if we're looking at the teams that are out there, non-Lakers, are the Suns more attractive? So if all of a sudden you're sitting there being like, all right, it's Suns versus Jazz, or you're looking at a Clippers team who's down 3-2 in their series right now, and then you've got Blazers, Nuggets. I can't say I'm exactly in love with either of those teams to be going on to the next round there. So for me, it seems like the Suns, you beat the Lakers, and you, of course, say, I hope that doesn't become their NBA Finals where you're just so happy to beat the Lakers. But if I'm taking everything off the board and saying which of these four teams, I think I kind of like the Suns. Same. Like I said, I mean, especially at that value, how do you say no? Um, you know, you mentioned maybe that beating the Lakers is like they're like de facto title and they're happy to do that. If they were just a regular young team, which they kind of almost are, I'd say yes. But they have Chris Paul and he is their leader. And Chris Paul will not be happy with anything other than an NBA title. So, and I don't think he's going to let them have that let up if they get through this. I mean, I'm pretty sure you could really take Chris Par- Chris Paul's right arm off and he would still find a way to fight and battle. That's, that's just the way that guy is built. Um, I do apologize. We haven't talked about the Blazers or the Nuggets, but yeah, I mean, I don't see how either of them can do anything deep in terms of a run. I mean, the Nuggets have no backcourt and Portland that doesn't know what defense is. So there's, there's no two issues, those two issues. And like, it's been a great series to watch and Damian Lillard is just insane. Um, but I don't think they're going to do that. And it's also hard to talk about the Mavericks. Uh, Luka Doncic is a human cheat code, and it doesn't make any sense. But the rest of that team doesn't really offer much. I mean, Tim Hardaway provides some secondary scoring, but, you know, Porzingis is a shell of himself. He doesn't have that lateral movement anymore. He's a big guy that doesn't play big, so I don't know how much value he can really provide. And, you know, Carlisle actually went to, like, Boban Marjanovic, started last night. It was, like, super big front line with David Kristaps. It was very weird, but it worked. And then the Clippers are the Clippers. Like, I don't understand 
why they're not good. I mean, Kawhi's playing well and Paul George is playing well. Reggie Jackson's giving them some death scoring, but like they still just seem to like lose games. And in like clutch moments, like you saw when they were down by, was it down by one last night? And like that key shot, like Kawhi and PG didn't even touch the ball. Like I think Morris passed it up to Man, who took like a crazy drove and then got him. Like it, it just seems like that team just doesn't seem to be able to put it together, even though they have two of the more dynamic two way talents in the league. So yeah, I think you're going to look at that. This is the Jazz versus the Lakers Suns winner. And I think those are probably your two best bets. And when I look at that, I've got one team at plus 140, another team at, you know, better than 10 to one. And they're both kind of evenly matched. I think you got to go with Phoenix right now, at, just at those odds. So Clippers are currently plus 135 to win the series versus the Mavericks. And I remember sitting there before game five thinking it would be so Clippers to not win game five because this is the game that they're supposed to win and be like, all right, the Clippers are good because on last week's podcast, the big conversation was, all right, Clippers are down 0-2 to the Mavericks right now. They're currently plus 300 to win the series. One contingent says, boom, so much value on the Clippers right now. They can go ahead and do it. The other contingent says, there's something wrong with this Clippers team. We've seen this before. Paul George chokes in the playoffs. I don't think they're going to be able to make it happen. So I stay away from the action. And naturally, the Clippers go and win the next two games. You're like, man, I sure wish I would have had that. And then, boom, they leave. They go and lose game five. And you're like, well, I really don't know what to think about all of this because – it's it's almost like the Clippers are that game seven malaise we were talking about with the with the Knicks and the uh, Leafs where you're like, I just don't understand or don't know, even though I see Kawhi and PG and not in love with the other pieces. But when looking at what else is out there in the West, of course, Kawhi could just go and run sh- like with everything that we've talked about right now. We're not in love with the Jazz. The Suns, we do like. Um Nuggets, Blazers, not exactly in love with them. Like, this is wide open for Clippers plus 550 to win the West. Like, they win the next two games, and all of a sudden, the narrative once again, because we've already seen that. First two games, Clippers are done, Kawhi to Miami. Next two games, boom, Clippers are now the new team in L.A. I don't have a clue what to think about this. And I'm staying away from the Clippers, but it seems to me that they have the most upside from a ceiling potential if you want to throw some futures action, but they also have the potential to lose this next game. And you're sitting there being like, well, I have to sort of expect that because that's the Clippers. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I got sucked into betting on the Clippers last night. Um, but I will say that like, I bet on the Clippers because I thought Luca was still really hurt. I mean, I, I think he is like, I think he's battling with, you know, this neck injury and it's something that I guess hampers you more than when you're not playing than when you actually are active. But I mean, they just they destroyed Dallas in game four because like Luca was a shell of himself and like the whole team crumbled. So it's like, oh, Luca won't be 100%. And then Luca came over that first quarter and said, hey, guys, I'm totally fine and I'm the best player in the world right now. Deal with it. And I look at this Clippers and like I said, like, I just, I don't understand. Like, I don't have a reason to point out why they struggle. You know, like they, like I said, their star players are playing well. You know, Reggie Jackson is getting some third scoring. I mean, Batum and Morris, those guys, they're kind of inconsistent, but they're, at least they show up once in a while. Rondo, playoff Rondo is done. I well, maybe like you that. just identified it because you just said Jackson and Morris as like the number three <laughs> and four of what we're looking yeah. here right there. So if we're leading with secondary scoring is Reggie Jackson and then one of the Morrises, and we've seen the roller coaster that can be one of the Morrises, maybe that's our answer right there. Because if nothing else, if you're looking at the Suns, number three is your choice between CP, Booker, and DeAndre Ayton, and then a bunch of young upstarts. So give me what Phoenix has on the upside as opposed to what we know in what the Clippers have. So maybe that's the way we identify this. Yeah, I mean, that that kind of says it very well. And then, you know, the Clippers also just, they don't play great defense either. And, you know, you've got Kawhi Leonard, who's a fantastic defender. You've got Paul George, who's a fantastic defender. You know, you got some bodies and like Zubac and big guys, you go there. But they still don't seem to really ever clamp down on teams for extended periods. Whereas, you know, look at the Lakers. Even without AD, they still play great defense. The Suns play really good defense. And the Jazz play fantastic defense, you know, especially with Gobert anchoring that. So, yeah, you know, there's value in the Clippers if they can get through this. 
But I mean, they're struggling to beat a team that's really poor Zing or that's really sorry Doncic, and then a bunch of spare parts that are worse and like that wouldn't even be the number four or five option on the Clippers, and they're still struggling there. So when they face a team that's a little bit deeper, it's just hard to see them, you know, galvanizing together to actually make the run. All right, so let's move over to the East real quick. And the number one storyline for me and probably much everyone is the health of Joel Embiid because the 76ers before the playoffs, plus 300 to win the East, which is what I took, they're now plus 400 to win the East, meaning the market's saying we don't like what we're seeing out of Philly. Uh, Taking on a Hawks team that beat the Knicks looked very impressive. Series price plus 155 for the Hawks, minus 200 for the 76ers. And if Joel Embiid is not there in what we know about the history of the 76ers, who is the Eastern conference version of the Clippers, but in a different way, because they have so much potential, but then will they find a way to make this happen? And of course, Joel Embiid gets injured, which throws everything in, into chaos because are we really believing in Tobias Harris and Ben Simmons is the way that we're rolling down with this. And then you see the way that Trey young and Clint Capella and that Hawks team, not to get shiny object syndrome, but they got a big man. They've got some shooters. Uh, I was impressed overall by the Hawks right there. There's something in me that says, if there's no, if there's no Joel and bead, I think the Hawks could give the 76ers a run for their money. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I'd take it a step further. If there's no Joel Embiid, are the Sixers the more talented team? Um, and I know I, you want to avoid shiny object syndrome. You don't want to just be like, oh, look at the Hawks. They just dominated teams so they're better. But they kind of were banged up all year. And this is probably the healthiest and most complete we've seen the Atlanta Hawks. And when I say that complete, like you said, Capella is a fantastic rim protector. He gets rebounds. Like he, al- he altered so many shots that the Knicks tried to take in that series. Like he was an actual like defining force. And when you look at no Joel Embiid, the Sixers don't really have someone that can then counter that without him. You know, they can't, you know, the thing that Embiid does, not only is he just a dominant player, but Embiid can also pull Capella out, you know, to the perimeter, get him away from the hoop so that the Sixers can actually attack a little bit. No Embiid, the Capella's probably going to sit there again and just kind of keep away all these driving shots, which is a nightmare for Ben Simmons because Ben Simmons can't shoot. Uh, the second thing is the Hawks got like eight guys that can bang threes all day long. You know, between, you know, Trey, Bogdanovich, Hunter, Collins, Herder, Gala, like, they just had this endless array of shooters and they hit open shots. Like they're not, they're not going to be giving you too many, too many freebies. I know they're a little cold against the Knicks in the first half in game five, but then the heat, they got hot and you saw them pull away. Um, the big question for this comes down to Trey Young. Um, I mean, the Knicks had no one that was even remotely capable of guarding him. He had his way. If he wanted to get in the paint, he could at will. And then he could either hit that little like running floater or he'd hit an open guy for a three when help came, or he could hit the 30 foot three. Uh, I'm going to look at the Sixers are probably going to put Ben Simmons on him, who is quicker than anything the Knicks have, much more taller and lankier. So he could give Trey some problems, but, you know, I mean, he can't, Simmons can't guard him the entire time. You know, he's not going to be playing, you know, all 35, 40 minutes on him. And that's going to be a lot of work. Um, and then I look at the defensive end. For the Knicks, one of the things that Tom Thibodeau didn't do, which really shocked me, is he didn't try to find more ways to attack Trey Young on the defensive end. Whether it's pick and rolls, whether it's, you know, use Bullock or Alec Burks to post him up and, like, make him actually expend some energy on defense to slow down his offense. And I don't see the Sixers doing that either. You know, between, you know, I can probably see Young likely guarding, you know, Seth Curry, who just kind of hangs out on the three-point line, or Danny Green, who hangs out on the three-point line, or maybe, like, Maxi when he comes in. So I don't see them being able to really take advantage of Young's defensive deficiencies. So when I look at this, if there's no Joel Embiid, like where are the points going to come from, from the Sixers outside of Toby Harris and Curry, you know, when you need them, whereas the Hawks, they got ways they can score. I mean, if you want to double team Trey Young, uh, uh, sorry, DeAndre, Hunt, DeAndre Hunter showed, he can go uh, get his own shot. He can take guys off the dribble. You know, he's probably going to be able to take Tobias Harris. So I think you look at this value for the Hawks right now, and like, you got to like them if Joel Embiid doesn't play. Yeah, and I think that there is going to be some uncertainty there. And with no Joel Embiid, I do like the offensive fire put or the offensive output for the Hawks better because if we're getting into Seth Curry as the number three 
for the Sixers with no Joel Embiid. You just list off like eight guys who could score 20 points for the Hawks. I love their depth there. Uh, I'm considering a sprinkle on the Hawks, but it's kind of challenging already being on the 76ers. Mm -hmm. Don't want to hedge myself out there, which makes the Bucks net series. Oh, so juicy because if we have uncertainty for Embiid moving forward throughout the playoffs, like we're seeing with Anthony Davis, then the likely uh, team to come out of the East is going to be Bucks Nets. Nets currently minus 200 bucks plus 160 coming out of this series. Both teams very impressive in their series. What do you like about this matchup? Because the value would seem to be on the Bucks because this is one that everybody identified right out of the gates that whoever can win this one, this is the team that could likely win the title. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I had the Nets as my preseason uh, title favorite. That was before they even got Harden, and I loved them once the playoffs started too. Um, the Bucks looked great in dominating Miami, though. But the problem is Miami was so bad at shooting in that series that it kind of covered up the fact that Milwaukee's not the defensive juggernaut it was of years past. Like I think the Heat shot under forty percent for the entire series, and the only game they kept close was Game One when they hit twenty threes. Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> For Milwaukee, the Nets are really good offensively. You know, like they, they these guys can shoot, they can create, and they can score. And it's a really tough matchup for the Bucks because I don't think Milwaukee wants to get into like a run and gun, fast paced series against these guys because you know Kevin Durant and Kyrie and Harden, that's in their element. They'll be happy to just run and gun and drop 147 on you like they did against the Celtics. But if the Bucks try to slow it down and go into this half court tempo that really kind of shuts down what Giannis does best, which is, you know, get an open space, go to the hoop. And so, you know, I think, you know, the Bucks they either have to take away their biggest strength or play into their opponent's biggest strength for this series. Um, the other thing that's uh, going to be understood is, you know, losing Dante DiVincenzo is actually a big loss from Milwaukee. He's arguably their best perimeter defender. So, you know, he probably would have had to take Kyrie or Harden. And now you got to go down that death chart a little bit more. You know, Middleton's going to have to guard one of them. You're going to get, you know, holiday maybe. But then you get, once you get on the bench, it's a little tougher. So I just think this is going to come down to, you know, you get in that final five minutes of a game. And you've got, you know, Giannis and Middleton and Holiday against KD, Kyrie, and Harden. Who are you going to go with? And, like, I can't not go with BK's big three. Because, like, those, all those guys can hit clutch shots. All those guys can score off their own dribble at any time. Then you, know, you also had like Joe Harris is there too, just for that extra like, kind of shooter. Um, I just think that, you know, Milwaukee had a really good matchup in the first round and they, you know, they looked really strong, but I just think the way this series is going to play out, it is really hard to kind of go against Brooklyn just with all the firepower they have and how it, the, the play styles are really not going to favor Milwaukee as the series goes on. If, you or anyone is going to be taking the, the nets in this series. Then I see no reason why you don't just take them right now to win the title, because if we have uncertainty for the 76ers, the team that was supposed to be the biggest challenge for them. And we have no idea what's coming out of the West. Brooklyn seems like they should just steamroll their way through the rest of the playoffs, obviously easier said than done, but just straight from a value standpoint, they're going to be favored each step of the way. And the LeBron team that we thought could maybe stop this Nets team. They're not that same team right there. You put them up against this Suns team or this Clippers team or this jazz team. It's going to be a no contest. So I know of course, no one's really a fan of, um, doubling down on the favorites later on, but I'm not a fan of dropping minus 200 in a series price. So I would rather be sitting there with some sort of plus money on the nets, as opposed to laying a two for one there. I'll be looking to play this series in different ways just because there will be opportunities right there on, Hey, maybe Milwaukee gets one and you can get uh, a buy low on the nets. I mean, I think that's what you're really hoping for yeah. is ways to get into there. Um, or as the series goes on, if it's a deeper series right there, does that change your mind at all? Let's say uh, we're going into uh, game five, I guess it's two, two going into game five. Would that change your perspective? If Milwaukee is finding a way to get to, because if they're down three, one series over, but if it's two, two, all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, we can maybe win this. Yeah. I think that'll also be something you kind of have to see like how the games go out. Like, you know, when you saw when Boston won that game against uh, Milwaukee or against Brooklyn, sorry, 
you know, Tatum went off for 50 and, you know, Brooklyn just kind of like a little sluggish with that. It just, you know, they could just see they weren't playing their brand of basketball. And when they played their brand of basketball, you know, they had no problems. Um, so I'm going to look, especially in this series, like, you know, can the Bucks take Brooklyn out of their comfort zone? Like, can they make Brooklyn, you know, play not in rhythm and kind of play disjointed? And how does that work? You know, if the Nets, you know, say the Nets shoot like 30% from the field and they still come away with a win, I'm going to be concerned for Milwaukee. But, you know, if say through those first four games, you know, Brooklyn just, you know, a lot of turnovers and they're playing a lot of like iso ball and they're not playing that free flowing offense. Yeah. Then maybe you start looking at the Bucks like, all right, they figured out something as a way to do it. So I'm going to, like you said, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. Um, my first thought also to get more value is maybe you look at like the Nets and six or like, a, you know, a series that goes six games or less, something like that. Um, or like, again, the classic live bet, if maybe Milwaukee steals one game one, then you can get that reduced value on Brooklyn. That'd be a way to play it. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to be an interesting one to see how the odds shift throughout the series as we get each game and as we see how each team kind of reacts to what's been thrown and what's being shown. All right, so let's move this over to the NHL playoffs. And when you and I first spoke pre-playoffs, one of the questions was, hey, in years past, we have seen anything happen. Eight seeds beat one seeds. Upsets happen all the time in the NHL. And I gave you a list of three series that were heavily favored. Uh, the Leafs are one, the Oilers are one, and I don't even remember when Carolina was the other one. And lo and behold, Leafs loses a minus 275 favorite to the Canadians. Oilers get destroyed as a minus 186 favorite to the Jets. Penguins lose as a minus 150 favorite to the Islanders. Want, want for me. That, that just hurt because the worst player in the series was the most important player, Tristan Jari, the goalie. Why should we moving forward ever believe the NHL playoffs will ever be any different? Like to me, it seems like we should always be betting so much on these underdogs because year after year after year, and we saw it in the Oilers shiny object syndrome, but the Leafs, I mean, history repeating itself again. Yeah. And I mean, even to take it further, like, I mean, the hair, the hurricanes were tested by Nashville and, you know, uh, Minnesota took Vegas to seven games. Like, the dogs are fighting back. Um, you know, I, I look at this and I, well, I think we'll start, maybe let's start with the Penguins. Like you said, Jerry was the worst player in that series. Um, that was a weird series because Pittsburgh actually outplayed them for the majority of it, like in possessions and analytics. But I think uh, the Islanders had like 13 expected goals for that series and they finished with 21. So like that's, like Jerry was not just the worst player in the series, he might've been the worst player in the playoffs period. Um, and so that's the first thing, you know, goalies matter. And then all goalies also matter. Look at Carey Price. You know, Carey Price was for the Habs, that rock beacon for them, you know, throughout the series. And, you know, he just kept Montreal in every game long enough that the nerves started to creep in for Toronto. And, you know, the doubt, you know, instead of just rolling over this team, you know, they still have to stick around, they still have to fight, and they just wilted under the pressure. Um, Edmonton, same thing. I mean, they actually, the oldest kind of outplayed the Jets in possession wise and even strength a lot of that series. But Connor Hellebuck was unbeatable and you know he kind of stole a couple games and they kept mcdavid off the scoreboard and you know again they were gone um but i just look i go back to montreal it's crazy like they were the you know statistically the worst team in the playoffs for two straight years and last year they you know they upset the penguins in that 512 qualifying this year they upset the leafs in the first round like you know it just shows you that a lot of this regular season stuff can go out the window and it comes back to you know in the playoffs it's all about effort and will and it's a whole new season i mean you know it's Unlike basketball, where, you know, you only have five guys on the court and one guy can make such a difference because they play, you know, 30, 40 minutes of a 40 minute game. In hockey, you know, your best players still only play like 20 minutes and that's only a third of the game. So that's still two thirds of the game that the other guys got to do it. And if you have a team top to bottom, that's just working harder and giving the best that can make up for a lot, you know, a lot of those like 50, 50 matchups can then swing to the team that worked harder. And when you see these dogs that have nothing to lose and they're playing with house money because they're not expected to win. They're just more comfortable and more relaxed. Whereas these favorites, you know, they grip the sticks a little bit tighter and then all of a sudden they let that edge in. And that's how you kind of get these teams, you know, coming with these upsets all the time. Well, you mentioned all the other players on the team. The Islanders are currently sitting at one, one series against the, Bruins, but the Islanders are plus 160, Bruins minus 200. If you're a fan of four lines, then you've got to be a fan of what the Islanders do because their best line is arguably their fourth line, and they call their identity line. 
which way better name than the perfection line. <laughs> so you're sitting there. So let's look at some of the plus money in the series that's out there. And I want to start with this question for you. Right now, we've got two series that are 2-0. Carolina is currently plus 475, the Lightning minus 715. The Golden Knights are currently plus 550, Avalanche minus 835. So gigantic favorites and underdogs. Of those two dogs, which of them or both of them or none of them would pique your interest in terms of value and opportunity to come back because both Carolina and Vegas, very good teams. Yeah, I think I have to lean with Carolina as peaking me just a little bit more um, because they've actually had the five on five possession edge through the first two games in this series. Um, I think they actually had like 60%, uh, Corsi 4%, I think in the first game and they lost both games two one. The difference has been Andre Vasilevsky. He's stolen the show in both games. I think he has 3.8 goals saved above expected in the first two games already. So he's really just kind of stealing it. Um, I know, I think Sonino Niederreiter got hurt. So like there's a couple injuries there for Carolina, but they're playing really well. Like they're still playing good hockey. They're not getting outplayed. And two ones are tough losses. Now, what hurts them is that both those losses were at home. Whereas like now they got to go to Amelie Arena. And, this, and I think the Hurricanes only won one time there in the four games this season. Um, but the, listen, the under is always hitting in these games. It's hitting 13 of the last 17 head-to-head meetings. And I think it's hitting 12 of the last 16 in Tampa. So these are going to be low-scoring games. And if it's a low-scoring game, you've got a chance to win, um, I think. So that's, you know, Tampa's still not a scoring juggernaut. They're not, you know, blasting everything away like we're used to seeing. Um, it's just that they're playing really good defense and Vasilev is better. So I think, you know, the Hurricanes are more likely to stick around in every game and give them a chance. So I like that. Um, but then I look at Vegas, Vegas, you talk about domination, Vegas really outplayed Colorado last night. Like they had a 63.2 Corsi four percentage and they outshot the avalanche 41, 25. Um, but you know, Drew Bauer was great. Um, especially in that late third period, uh, power play, they stopped a lot. They looked really bad in game one. I get it. It was a laugher. Um, I don't know why they, the board put Leonard in, it just really, really backfired in every way possible. But the biggest thing for that series I'm looking at is, uh, Vegas has to stay out of the penalty box because Colorado is for, they're clicking like 43 and a half percent on the power play in the playoffs. And I think they're four for 11 against Vegas already. Vegas is only at 15% in the playoffs. Like they're just, the, the special teams is really a big mismatch there. But I, I just look at Colorado playing and man, like they're just on another gear and another level. Like when you see Nathan McKinnon on the ice, like he just looks different. He looks faster than everyone, you know, his vision. Like I think on that winning goal in overtime, like, you know, he has like those high strides and like he spun around out of the way, created space and then like snapped the pass to Rant and he banged it in. And they're just playing so well right now. It's hard for me to see Vegas coming back from the 2-0 deficit. That said, you know, you're never out of a series to lose at home. So like Vegas does get two games there and if they can even a two, three, it's a whole new series, but I'm just looking at the way Colorado is playing and how they're just so dominant how they're so they're just been flying compared to Tampa Bay has been you know, a little bit more defensive and you know, they're not like really pulling away in these games. And I just think, you know, Carolina can probably eat some more of these games and I like their chances a little bit better to get back into it. Right now, Colorado minus 275 to make the Stanley Cup final because looking at the other series, Canadians minus 225 versus the Jets. I think most people say whoever's going to win that series is going to lose to either Colorado or Vegas. The thing that intrigues me here is if we were to say Vegas would find a way to come back, so they're plus 550. Right now, they're plus 700 to reach the finals. So if they were to find a way to win the series, come back from 0-2, they would then be favored in the next series. So to me, the bet that intrigues me the most is Vegas plus 700 to reach the finals. Of course, that means they're going to have to steamroll or come back from the steamroll that is Colorado. But minus 275 is gigantic to come back. That's just a big number for Colorado. And remember what we led the top of the NHL with the amount of upsets that we've seen. Rarely does everything just go exactly cookie cutter right now, because we could be sitting there with Vegas winning the next two. And all of a sudden we're sitting in a two, two, two series. You're going to feel pretty good about a plus 550 to win this series or a plus 700 to get to the next round or to win the final. 
Yeah, especially, and I mean, like I said, Vegas was the second best team in hockey this year. Like, they were tied with Colorado in points. So, like, it's not like they're a pushover or they're, like, you know, a surprise story. Coming. Like, they're a very, very good team. Um, and I think they show that they can go toe-to-toe with Colorado. I mean, the season series is pretty close. And, you know, they outplayed them last night. Um, I think, you know, I think this odds and this line does reflect that 7-1 game one a little bit. And I'm just, you know, again, you kind of got to throw that one out. Like, you can just laugh it off. Like it just—it was a bad game, you know. Leonard didn't play well. Flurry's back, and it's Flurry struggled a little bit too. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it's—it's it's just such great value because, like I said, I, again, there's no gimmies, there's no absolutes. I mean, you can't say that the winner of the series is going to steamroll the North Division winner, but the talent gap there is really big. And you know, when you look at that matchup, like that potential one down the way, you know, Montreal again—they're finding a way to win, but they're not the most—they're the least talented team in the playoffs. And Winnipeg, like, we don't know what they are, really. I mean, they, they swept Edmonton, though they still got to play most games. We don't know what's going to happen with their star player, Mark Shifley, after that terrible hit last night. So, they, you know, they might not even get through. And if they get through, they might be shorthanded. Um, so looking at that, I mean, this is this Vegas-Colorado series kind of almost makes me think of, like, the Brooklyn-Milwaukee series in the NBA. Like, these are kind of like the two best teams left. And whoever comes through this really has the clear edge. Uh, no disrespect to Boston and the Islanders or Carolina and Tampa Bay, but I think these two teams really just have like the full complement going. Um, so yeah, I mean, like if if you want to take that sprinkle, like I mean, it's never a bad idea to bet on a really good team at great plus money. I mean, just gotta hope that Colorado maybe kind of comes back to earth a little bit, you know, or maybe Grubauer shows some cracks in the eye when it's possible. So Jared, love jamming with you. Where can everybody connect with you? Well, you said you can find me on Twitter at JL Hawk. It's H O C H. And you can find uh, my work and all the work of all of my lovely coworkers at covers.com, covering all your hockey and basketball and every sport under the sun you can think of. And I want to hear from you. We got a lot to get down on. Whether it's do you believe in the Lakers? Do you believe in the Suns? Who do you have coming out of the West? Who do you got in that Bucks Net series? What do you believe about Joel Embiid's health? Are you going to sprinkle anything? on that avalanche night series is there anything in the world of hockey that does interest you you can hit me up on twitter at rob cressy and also make sure to tag at covers and remember if you want to be a sharp don't be a square with your bankroll be disciplined with your money management